Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome back to the show author, historian, publisher, and speaker, Mitch Horowitz. Mitch joins us to speak about his latest, and actually one of my favorite books of the year, The Miracle Club. Mitch Horowitz, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, yeah, indeed. I mean, congratulations on the latest book. I absolutely loved it. I think it's just, I, I, read, I read a lot of books uh, yes. with a job like this, and this is definitely one of my favorites for the year. It's, it's a really, really, appreciate really that. good book. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank yeah. you, Gordon. I've been, um, I was thinking about this because I had uh, um, Gary Luckman, one of our mutuals on the show earlier, uh, for one of sure. his books that came yeah. out this year, right? Which was Lost Knowledge of the Imagination. And I said mm-hmm. to Gary the same thing I'm going to say to you, which is that might be my favorite Gary Luckman book, but only uh-huh. because I've read all the other ones. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I can see in the latest book, in The Miracle Club, uh, a lot of, of Mitch's journey. It's a very personal book, which I enjoyed, but because I've seen all yes. the other ones, I'm like, ah, right. It's sort of, right. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's fascinating to see the conclusions you've drawn so far in your, you know, in a career as a historian and writer and publisher and so on. I just, it's so good, honestly. Oh, I appreciate that very much. It's my most personal book. And it's my first book that is, I suppose one could say almost typical, although I weave in, history, and I obviously weave in analysis and philosophy, but my wish was to write a book that really provided methods and techniques, those that I use in my own life. So it means a lot to me to hear you say that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've also written a history book that is also metaphysics because I'm of the opinion it's, it's sort of very difficult to slice and dice them if you do them right. I agree. I agree. I mean, once one gets into ideas, if you really want to present your ideas in a, in a serious way, even a practical idea has to be grounded in some sense of its past. One can't be ahistorical when presenting these things. It's never enough to say, well, look, isn't this a pretty little trinket? Why don't you see how this fits in your pocket? You know, but the, the real seeker wants to know, where does it come from? What's the family tree? So in that sense, I think we're, we're applying all our tools when we're working with good ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the points which you sort of bring up in the book, which I think is important as being a, uh, what you might say, a believing historian, my response yes. to that would be, you can't not be, because here's the thing. Yes. If, you, if you pretend to not be a believing historian, what you actually are is uh, someone who believes in the kind of um, overt, unexamined materialism that yes. is the rest of the world. There's sort of no such thing as a, a believing historian. You have to stake your flag somewhere. Absolutely true. And I often point out to people that almost all of our religious histories of any posterity about either the mainstream, all the alternative traditions are in fact written by people who come from within those congregations. That's true of our most significant books on, you know, emanating from the mainstream faiths, whether it be Catholicism or Judaism. It's absolutely true of many of the books written about the new religions, Christian science, Mormonism, Seventh-day Adventism, and to have a special need for the occultist to address the question of belief in his or her work, probably because occultism and esotericism is itself so bound to practice, which I think is is absolutely necessary and a good thing. And I never felt like I wanted to shy away from the disclosure that I'm a participant in the movements that I've written about historically. That was never something I wanted to shy away from. And as I said, and as you've pointed out, as you've very rightly alluded, everyone comes in with a belief system, whether they're writing as a as a 
a member of the congregation that they're writing about. They might be uh, in critical sympathy with the ideas, or they might be writing from a more materialist perspective, which frankly can get very boring very quickly in these kinds of books because when you approach the mystical, the esoteric, the occult, the ineffable with an attitude of uh, diehard certainty that this is just an oddity that belongs behind a museum case but doesn't hold anything of value for thinking men and women, you get into these laboriously sarcastic (laughs) sentences and tones that tend to color the work page after page after page and it makes for agonizing reading and it also makes for misleading reading because i think that in order to convey the impact and the nature of any movement you need to have at least some sense of the ideas and values that emanate from that movement if you don't it it hobbles your abilities even as a critical scholar or historian no, oh, absolutely. Um, one of my favorite anthropologists, Eduardo Viveros de Castro, says that the idea of theory and practice, or the idea that you can sort of do p- observation in a non participatory way and then sort of sit back and analyze it, like separating out theory and practice is itself a theory that emerges from a kind of unexamined, uh, you know, modern materialist view. It is, it's, you're still doing a practice. You were doing a materialist academic practice by separating them out. So it's another one of those things that's impossible to not bring to an examination. And I, this is what I, I love about this book. It's such a, um, yeah, it's such a wonderful way of, of, of exploring the currents of new thought and, uh, from someone who does them and someone who does them with such a depth of understanding of its history. I think it's amazing. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, given that we just mentioned New Thought, and this is a bit unfair because you have written a whole book on the subject, but what would be, I guess, a brief definition of it? It's really a movement, a modern movement, a modern movement with one basic principle, which is that thoughts are causative. And here in America, it grew out of what was known as the New England Mental Healing Movement, which was a movement in the mid to late 19th century that experimented with mind cure and prayer therapy. That movement itself was standing on the shoulders of transcendentalism. People were searching for a practical religious expression. People were asking themselves whether the days of the prophets and miracles and signs and wonders were part of a bygone past or whether Not only could these things be detected today, but could they be married to humanity's sense of the modern, this idea that everything had beneath it some unseen antecedent. Everything stood on some foundation that wasn't quite visible to us, but that served as a driving engine behind everything. So for Marx, for example, that was economics. Uh, For some of the early psychologists, not only Freud, but others that became the idea of childhood Uh, trauma or fissures in childhood that created our personalities. Um, For Louis Pasteur, it became germs. Um, For Albert Einstein, it became time and space. Uh, There were were all these ideas infusing modern thought that directed us to hidden causes, unseen causes, unknown antecedents. And for people who were interested in finding different possibilities with which to move through modern life, including non-physical possibilities, the idea of the existence of a subliminal mind, the existence of some kind of unseen possibilities or cosmic or ethereal principle of life through which the mind acted as a, uh, for which the mind was a, a kind of a channel or a mediating force, became a very captivating idea. And certain ideas traveled from Europe to America, mesmerism in particular, and they infused people with the hope, and and they were quite right in some respects, that there was an unseen dimension of thought, an unseen dimension of human life that wouldn't become known as the subconscious mind until very late in the 19th century. And some of the early experimenters in New Thought had an instinct, as Mesmer did a generation before them, that there was some underlying mind. There was some glacially unseen facet of mind that was really the engine 
behind cognition and, and, and all the other things that we ascribe to our everyday thought systems. And this movement eventually became called New Thought. And the people at the helm of this movement believed that the mind was in the driver's seat, so to speak, and the mind could influence health and relationships and outer events in the world and that there was an extent to which the mind controlled facets and aspects of the body and their perspective could seem very fanciful and one that required making great leaps of faith and yet they had a very shrewd instinct for human nature and their instincts foresaw many things that would be validated quickly in generations ahead, including in studies of the placebo response, including in the not yet born field of quantum physics, which now, classically speaking, is is over 80 years old and has put us in front of very tantalizing questions about the possibilities of perspective and the observer. Uh, they foresaw the field of serious psychical research, which despite great opposition has forged on as an important and, and vital science that has given us clues and hints and evidence and ideas of the mind's extraphysical properties. They foresaw developments in the current field of neuroplasticity, which uses brain scans to measure ways in which our sustained thoughts actually do alter the neural pathways through which electrical impulses travel in the brain. And the field of placebo studies itself has deepened and grown more broad and wide spanning in its questions in the 21st century than even its its modern progenitors could have imagined. We're seeing mm -hmm. things today like placebo surgeries, placebo weight loss, uh, honest placebos, people having uh, some sort of positive, measurable, therapeutic experience, even when they're administered a transparently inner sugar pill or some such that, that one i love right so my father's a psychiatrist yeah my father's a psychiatrist so i remember a few years ago i was using the placebo effect in one of our many benign debates about um the science of mind and uh and i mentioned placebo effects and he's like yeah but they only work um in the short term and then um the uh -huh. people the people who are on medication get better and the people who aren't don't and i'm like i think you find that's not in fact the case and i can use examples like that where people are literally handed a pill that says this is not the medicine and yes. it will still work that's amazing yeah <laughs> it's amazing and and harvard researchers have recently found that the placebo effect is measurable when you're using an active substance, when you're using a pharmacological substance that's considered an active medicine. If people are given positive information about the drug and have some sense of hopeful expectancy, they do better uh, than they would in a control group given no such information. And that was actually an insight that was held very specifically by the French mind theorist Emile Coué, who made the exact same observation from his little pharmacy in northwestern France in the early 20th century. And I contacted one of the architects of that Harvard study just about 18 months ago, and he said that they were not thinking of Coué when they designed that study, but that he, he, he knew about Coué, and he did fell, feel that uh, the Harvard team's and findings could comport well with Kuei's observations. Basically, this study, which was done with a migraine drug, gave us the gave us good reason to believe that the placebo effect is ever operative. It's going on all the time. It's not just when you're given an inert substance, but whatever is suggested to us, whether it be with a psychopharmacological substance or something else, has active effects based on expectation and information. So we're just in front of a whole range of findings in the placebo field that weren't even imaginable 80 years ago. And again, the pioneers of new thought in the late 19th, early 20th century not only foresaw a lot of this through their own instinct and practice, but in some cases used language that actually sounds like it's taken directly from neuroplasticity, for example, where they would talk about creating 
new grooves in the brain in way and they're using metaphorical language that's very close to what clinicians studying neuroplasticity use today. So new thought as a field has always been a popular mystical expression. It's always been associated as the kind of simple man's philosophy. It's always been in disrepute in opinion making circles, intellectual circles, academia, and yet it has proven very muscular in its findings, in its analysis. And the contention I made make in the book is that it does represent a path for serious people. It yeah. has been for me, but it also has growing up to do. It's filled with gaps and holes and dead ends, and those can't be ignored either. And the oh, movement, that, uh, look, Mitch, has been so yeah, successful, it's <laughs> ignored. I lo- I love the intro um, uh, because uh, I have this sort of theory going on that. Uh, a lot of these forgotten ideas over the last 15 years are being updated or I call jailbroken. It's happened with magic. It's sort of happening with anthroposophy and so on, where there is a lot of nonsense that has historically accrued over these things, but there are serious people who are jailbreaking it or making it bioavailable and and revivifying it. And what I loved about the intro, so let's do that, because you list in the intro what's wrong with it today in its contemporary practice. So what's wrong with New Thought, Mitch? What's wrong with New Thought is... It succeeded so well at creating a popular literature like The Power of Positive Thinking and The Secret and books and movies that reference the law of attraction that it never really examined its own skeletons, specifically the inability to address people who are suffering, the inability to address people who have terminal or chronic diseases and who are not, in fact, going to recover from them, the inability to address people who have been stricken with health problems or other forms of problems without implicitly blaming for their own misfortune by claiming that they're not doing it right or their their thoughts are not vibrating on the correct wavelength, which is what has irritated and angered people about new thought over the decades and and the critics are correct the critics are correct and new thought has not developed a theology of suffering that's been its greatest failing and that's something i try to do in the book i at least make an attempt because the philosophy will never be it will never come into its own as a truly truly serious philosophy for feeling thinking people without addressing suffering in a compelling way. And that's New Thought's primary flaw. It became a philosophy for winners, filled with truth, filled with good ideas, but it was never capable, it never allowed itself to be capable of addressing life and its complexity. And that's something I try to accomplish in the book. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, some really fascinating discussions around that. It gets sort of the good bits of life right and the bad bits of life wrong. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly it. You know, and and when it works, so to speak, it's wonderful and and it's to be celebrated, but people who don't ha- have a path to recovery from some sort of chronic condition or who have been dealt a devastating difficulty by life, new thought I think doesn't speak well to them. And that's a grave problem that the philosophy has never been kept up nights by. We should be kept up nights by that, and we should stay up nights until we find a way to speak to people who are in suffering or abandon our philosophy, you know, because you can't abandon half of the human race that's struck with tragedy and say, well, gee, we want to stick with the winners, you know, that's nuts, or those who want to join them. That's insufficient. Uh, the contention I've always made and that I uh, amplify, under, at least within our experience and within this physical framework that we occupy, we live under many laws and forces. And I've never liked the contention often heard on the new age that there are no accidents, that everything is somehow meaningful and forwarding in life. If you live in the Philippines and you're struck by a terrible monsoon, that's for reasons of climate, that's for reasons of geography, that's for reasons of weather patterns and cold fronts over which the population has no control. And I I think that New Thought has to be able to address people who are forced to consume half a loaf of bread. Sometimes life is half a loaf of bread for, for reasons that are no fault of the individual. But that half loaf can also be consumed standing fully erect and using the possibilities and powers of the mind in a way that gives you the broadest possible number of options 
which I think is a real thing too, and which I think is a vital part of life, without being told by anybody that somehow your suffering is due to your wrong thought vibrations. Rather, uh, life is shot through with so many laws and forces and causes, and the mind is one of them. The mind is one of them. And that's fantastic enough. That possibility is extraordinary enough, and it can occupy the thoughtful individual with a lifetime of experimentation without denying all these other forces that uh, we're forced to contend with under this framework that we live under. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, as you say, the critics are right when they observe that it, it's just not reasonable to say you're poor because you're not thinking hard enough. But by the same yes. token, there are um, two things can be true, as you sort of said, because there are other forces yes. and so on. There are two things can be true. And one of the, one of the parts I really enjoyed in the book, and it's sort of a weird way of phrasing this question, Mitch, but do you think yep. most people know how to want things? Or is it initially harder and then easier, maybe, than it first appears? That's a, actually, it's a wonderful question. My contention is that most of us don't know how to want things in the sense that we are so blinded by peer pressure, by habit, by things that we've told ourselves for many, many years that we have difficulty distinguishing between convention and authenticity, even within our innermost moments. You know, people are persuaded. I'm walking around with all these hopes and wants and dreams that I don't get any of them. And, you know, then some guy like Horowitz comes along and tells me that my mind has these causative properties. Well, he must be wrong. And I would say to such a person, let's take a yellow light. Let's just take a yellow light here for a moment, because actually, I believe that things occur in our lives that may have antecedents or have occurred over intervals of time that prompt a lot of forgetfulness in us. Sometimes we're not altogether in touch with what we really want or have wanted in life. And sometimes it it warrants taking out a blank piece of paper, even if just as an individual internal experiment, which we tell no one about, and asking ourselves, what do I really want? And have I been in touch with it? Or am I repeating to myself things that I've repeated to myself by rote for years and years and years? Like, you know, I want a good job, or I want to have kids, and I want to travel to exotic places. Well, you know, which is it? You know, because having kids and traveling to exotic places can be at odds. And you might need to ask yourself uncomfortable questions that might feel embarrassing, or that might feel selfish, or that might feel narrow, you know, but not everyone wants to be a corporate go-getter, or not every spiritual cares in only a secondary way about money, for example. Sometimes we call ourselves spiritual, um, but we have all kinds of material wants and wishes that we've pushed into the background, not just when we're in public, but more importantly, when we're in private. So I ask people to re-examine the statements that they make to themselves in their most intimate, internal, exquisitely private moments. And ask yourself whether you're being frank with yourself, whether you're being true with yourself. It's just an experiment, but you could discover remarkable things, like you don't want that job at all. What you really want is security. What you really want is to sit under a blanket and read a book, which is wonderful. And you associate having that job with the security that will get you to that place. But don't confuse ways and means. Even if there's not a way that you can throw off your worldly responsibilities and climb under a blanket and read a book, even if there's not a at present, at least know that that's what you want. At least don't be a stranger to yourself. So I really appreciate that question because I think that we do walk around as strangers to ourselves and we don't pause long enough to at least challenge our self-perceptions. And when I say challenge them, I mean challenge them in private. You can really go into a very private place within and ask yourself what you want without any embarrassment, without any disclosure, without any peer input, and you might be quite surprised. Yeah, so the barriers, I mean, I really resonate with that quite a bit. The barriers are um, people don't want to, and, and for a lot of socially acculturated reasons and, and so on, they're uncomfortable with the idea that they could either want or deserve something. And and to be honest about yes. what that is, I mean, it's it's, o- it's okay to want to be wealthy. And as you say, it's, it's an yes. exquisitely private 
sitting with your own uh, desires and goals. You don't have to tweet them, my goodness. Amen, amen. Nothing is more deleterious to the internal search than sharing it. You know, there is something that we've lost in the power of silence that should be respected and should be revisited and should be reexamined. Because it's, it's very common that even people close to us might have conflicted feelings about whether our wants and desires are going to take something from them or are going to distance us from them or put us into some situation where we're not taking care of their wants and desires anymore. There's so much that could be said about silence. The whole book could be written on just that. When you're engaging in self-scrutiny, it's critically important to be silent. Uh, There are certain things you don't want to vet with other people, even people with whom you're intimate. There are certain places you must go alone. And asking yourself, what is my innermost wish in in life? I believe that's a place you must go alone. Yeah. And so is that particularly hard for what we might call spiritually minded people in the West? And and sort of, if so, why is that? I think spiritually minded people in the West, like, like all of us, like all of us within our subcultures and peer groups, we get filled with language that's not necessarily really our own. And there's no reason why those of us within the alternative spiritual culture should be any more immune to this than people we might look at as being part of the traditional culture or even fundamentalist cultures. You know, within the New Age culture, and I don't use New Age in a negative way at all, within the New Age culture, we hear things about non-attachment and non-identification and getting to the essence of things and avoiding spiritual materialism. And to me, these are ideas that have been recycled over and over and over for centuries that are very often picked and unmoored from ancient traditions that developed in other cultures and other languages and other times and other places that we have kind of uh, exported into the 21st century present. And these ideas very often reach us through the influence of people who themselves have imbibed translations of translations of translations of of ancient Vedic and, and Buddhist ideas dealing with non-attachment, non-identification, questions of samsara and illusion. And I I very seriously question in the book whether those ideas are serviceable uh, to the Western seeker in the 21st century. I use the West as an example only because that's my vantage point. That's where I'm from. But my contention is that every religious idea emerges from a certain culture, a certain time, a certain place, a certain geography. And, and and it's it's intended to address the ways and means and needs of men and women from that time, place, culture, and geography. Now, some of these ideas about non-attachment, for example, grew out of religious traditions that may have very beautiful and universal insights, but that nonetheless emerged from ardently caste-based uh, societies in which social or economic mobility literally impossible as space travel. And although I think there's great and beautiful universal ideas before which I fall to my knees emanating from the Eastern traditions, one must be very, very careful about importing those ideas into a 21st century Uh, Western life, where they may not be suited to the psychology and the ideals and the innermost sense of self and attainment that belongs to the 21st century individual. My contention is, quite frankly, and I say this as somebody uh, who is uh, 52 years of age, who has been on the path for some time, my contention is that I don't believe that the Western seeker can be happy or will be happy without coming to terms with some sense of his or her own wish for attainment in whatever that means to the individual, including in material directions, including in material expressions. I find the greatest observation in this area in the dictum of Christ, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and God's what is God's. We do live in both worlds. 
And I'm not even sure I want to make that distinction between both worlds, mm. so to speak. There is the material, there is the transcendent. I'm not sure the two can be divided out or should be divided out or that that effort is even helpful. But we know that we are here for a fixed period of time within this world that represents the coin of Caesar. And we owe something to it. And we owe something to it. And we're owed something by it. And if we take seriously the, the, the dictum as above, so below, or the notion that the individual is created in the image of, of the highest, it stands to reason then that within this framework that we find ourselves, we too are creators, producers, we're generative. And that's going to mean different things to different individuals, of course. But I think it's, I think it's a sacred part of human existence to strive to produce, to want to be part of the creative circuitry of life, whatever that means to the individual, allowing for the fact that that may be different from my neighbor than for me. Um, but I think that, that w w we shouldn't be forced to reprocess that through all kinds of logical or spiritual uh, language and filters and ideas. I think that in itself, the idea of human productivity in itself, is sacred, in itself is participating in the highest, in itself fits in with the, the framework of as above, so below, with rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar and God what is God's, not as two things, but I think as one thing. I, I don't slice up those areas of my life today, and frankly, it's been much more much more relaxing for me. You know, oh, yeah. In the full sense. <laughs> I resonate you know? with that. Uh, there's an anecdote you tell in the book about um, translations of Buddhist texts and, and you kind of explaining what they look like in English to someone who's actually Chinese. <laughs> and, and, and why, I, uh, why yes. I bring that up is a, a regular guest on the show who writes a series of books on the Thai occult called Jenks. Um, he's, what I find fascinating when we uh, attempt to import some of these Buddhist ideas, not attachment and that kind of stuff into a quote unquote Western frame is that we actually miss a very important class analysis, which is when yes. you're, when you're looking at how people, the majority of people in a country like Thailand actually live, they're doing animist magical practices that look much closer to new thought practices than Buddhist mm -hmm. non-attachment. And they have their own moral structure, which we're about to get to about accumulating merit and so on. But there's a respectability component where they'll kind of nod along and say they're Buddhist, but in the meantime they'll toddle yeah. off to the graveyard or the crossroads and and do magic to help their family or their farm or, or whatever and all these techniques are um, structurally similar to the kind of things you see in new thought and we miss that we miss that when we uh, get the import into the west of buddhist texts in the same way that no one not even the pope is especially good at being catholic um and we sort of right. miss that <laughs> you know yes yes uh, it was funny, yes, I appreciate your noting that anecdote in the book. There was a, a translator in the city of Shanghai, and she was working on a translation of my previous book, uh, One Simple Idea, which the Chinese government was kind enough to censor about one-third of, because <laughs> they didn't like the political content of it. Um, and she was trying, as a young woman who grew up in a culture that was simultaneously Buddhist and atheistic, uh, to understand some of the concepts in the book. And when I began to repeat to her in a way of trying to bridge the gap in understanding that she and I were experiencing as different people working together from across a chasm of, of different uh, uh, contemporary cultures, I was repeating to her certain Buddhist ideas of non-attachment that at least we colloquially understand in the West. And she was at a complete loss as to what I was talking about. <laughs> and it was funny, and this was somebody who, who comes from you know, a traditional culture. Um, and China, of course, is in great transition today in every way, economically and spiritually. And I think the government there is, is um, extremely wary of any kind of spiritual ideas entering uh, public life, although at the same time, they're, they're tolerant of new thought because new thought has to it, let's face it, an acquisitive side. And uh, at this point in time, the government is uh, encouraging of uh, business development within certain parameters. So new thought seems to them like a spirituality that's okay. Uh, but when you get down to the nitty gritty and you start to talk about certain implications of people creating their own iteration of reality and, 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 and having uh, uh, a sense of 
the availability of the infinite within them and and that creating a, a great vast uh, internal freedom, uh, suddenly the government is no longer so friendly. And so they cut about one third of my book. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. Uh, yeah. So new thought when people hear the word. Uh, the first sort of thing that comes to mind is is a notion of mind. It's even implied in the name, right? New thought. Yeah. But sure. what about feelings in general and, and how they appear to, and I mean, I, they do, but let's talk about how they contribute to various praxis. Yeah. You know, one of the things I, I try to hit upon in the book is that sometimes within new thought, we may mistake referring to thoughts and feelings as if they're interchangeably the same thing. And of course, not only are they not, but sometimes they're very much at odds. And we have thoughts about things uh, and, and our feelings, never, never mind our physical sensations, which is another issue altogether, our feelings are going off and doing something else. You know, I might vow I'm not going to get into the same argument with my neighbor, Mike, you know, today, but, you know, Mike does something that I experience as provocative or threatening. And my emotions are often running, even though I had, in my comfortable armchair, very sincerely made the vow to myself, you know, not this time. As a teacher once put it, pitting thought against emotion is like pitting steam power against nuclear power. There's just no contest. Emotion is going to overpower you every time. And then, of course, there are physical urges. Uh, I mean, if, 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 if thought were everything, it would just be a question of vowing, uh, I won't drink again, or I will stop taking this drug, or I'll stop overeating, or whatever it is. But the body wants what it wants. The body wants this calming influence, and it usually gets it. So the question for those of us dedicated to new thought becomes, you know, not so much using thought in itself to serve as a generative, causative agent, but the psyche needs to be employed as a whole, the physical, the emotional, and thought. And there are certain mo moments in life where that can be done. There are certain moments in life where practices can, can, can help unify or at least harness the energy of, of moments where we're unified in body, emotion, thought. They do come. We mustn't, we mustn't mistake all these things for being the same thing, but we mustn't tell ourselves they can never be unified. And there are certain methods and exercises, some of which I think were understood by the, the early timers, the pioneers, that we can revive today with a better understanding, with sometimes a very clinically validated understanding oh yeah and, oh my goodness so i just got to interrupt there because the thing that uh, the thing that um what because obviously with a book like this um <laughs> you're you're writing for the lean forward audience of, of people who are into it and you also have yeah. to kind of do the well in fact here i am marshalling my case and and the i was particularly interested in some of the as you say the kind of like clinical and and research evidence uh, around particularly settings and environments that evoke youth having an impact on the elderly because isn't that something uh, that's yes. somewhere yeah. in between marsilio ficino and anton levey uh but it, yes. it's it, it's <laughs> It's That's amazing. Right. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, and, and I find that obviously my background being um, you know chaos magic and, and occultism in a specific ritual sense. I'm like, this is ritual. This is what they're doing. Yes. They're they're evoking. Uh, they're literally evoking uh, youth by getting in the right headspace and the right feel space, uh, and yes, and that appears to make that yes, work yes. better. And that's amazing. Now you know, here's something I don't write about this in the book only because I came to it more recently, but. The depth of my respect and love for Anton LaVey's work has really increased dramatically over the past 11 or 12 months, heavily through the influence of my friend Carl Abrahamson, who went way back with Anton. And Anton married him. Very <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, How yeah, Carl's been on the show. He's a great guy. Oh, he's, hmm. he's really become a person I cherish, and he's become a very dear friend very quickly. Uh, Carl's book, A Culture, was a huge influence on me because I had a sense that I wasn't fully appreciating Anton's career, but it wasn't a scent trail that I ever really followed. And Carl helped me follow it. And, you know, apropos of what you were just describing about uh, certain clinical studies finding that it people into settings that evoke nostalgia, they seem to do better. They seem to, their, their, their blood pressure seems to lower. Certain stress factors uh, seem to lift from their physical set. Uh, sometimes, in some cases, they'll 
they'll, they'll lose weight, their muscle mass will improve. And even contrary to everything we've been raised in a materialist culture to understand, eyesight is found to improve. Why should any of this be? Why should any of this be? It's, it's extraordinary. I'm referring to studies that have been done by a Harvard psychologist named um, Ellen Langer, where she would place the elderly starting in the 1980s in settings that were nostalgic and find that symptoms of dementia reversed themselves. Fatigue reversed itself. This, these were things that uh, she was capable of measuring um, among, her, among her experiment subjects. And now going to a different neck of the woods, Anton LaVey made the wonderful observation that what he called total environments fantasy environments, Disney-like environments, recreations or creations in a ritualistic way of what the individual is desirous of can be hugely empowering, can be tonic for the spirit in ways that, that might not be predictable or, or, or even understandable to the person who hasn't dealt with this in an experiential way. And it's, it's quite extraordinary. You know, I, I had a friend who made an interesting observation on Twitter um, several months ago. And it was one of these observations that I looked at and I said, mm, that's interesting. And it's been completely haunting to me and it keeps coming back to me. And she made this observation that she found that people who were into chaos magic or ceremonial magic into the aesthetic that Anton uh, helped popularize or repopularize here in the West, anybody who traveled in magical or ceremonial chaos or, or satanic circles seemed to look 15 years younger than their age. Yes. And I thought, Woo! Why would that be? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I thought, why would that be? And it, it could be, it could be that it comports with exactly what we've been discussing, whether it's the experiments of uh, Ellen Langer from Harvard or whether it's the total environment uh, prescribed and practiced by Anton and his his admirers, this notion that we are in touch with aesthetics that seem vital, that seem life giving, that keep us attached to who we essentially believe we are, that can have effects that we haven't fully come to terms with. That we're, we're, we're sort of struck by in a, in a very curious way, and that's something to pay careful attention to. It's something to pay careful attention to. Things happen when you place people in environments that are favorable to them in some way, or when you tell people something about their environment, something that may be entirely true that they haven't realized or grokked to. Another interesting experiment that had, uh, emerged from the, the same psychologist studies, Ellen Langer, and this is really quite fascinating, and I, I want people to look this up themselves, see if I'm exaggerating it. I challenge them. She did a study with a group of hotel maids here in the States, and she found uh, that she was struck curious that many hotel maids, at least in her observation, seemed to be somewhat overweight. And she asked herself, why should this be? Because when you're on your feet all day long as a hotel maid, you're getting aerobic and anaerobic exercise that your average office worker is not getting. And so she wondered what would happen, and these are facts, and she wondered what would happen if she pulled together a group of hotel maids and she told a group of them, she explained a group of the, to a group of them what the facts were. The facts are that everything that you're doing all day is actually a pretty good form of exercise, and it's going to have physical benefits according to everything we understand. And then there was another group, a control group, to whom she told nothing. The very information that she provided to this group of hotel mates who were studied over a period of about six to eight weeks resulted in weight loss, lower blood pressure, and improved uh, muscle to body fat ratio and other measurable physical improvements as well. Nothing had changed in their work routine. All that had changed was that Ellen explained to them the actual benefits of the job environment that they happened to find themselves in. And the result, without any change in outward physical activities or, or, or occupational duties, was weight loss, lower blood pressure, and improved muscle ratio. Why should that be happening at all? 
Why should that be happening at all? Accuracy itself, accuracy in thinking, proved to have physical benefits to these workers uh, as opposed to a control group who had no benefits at all, yet nothing apparently changed in their outward work routine. These are questions that we shouldn't jump to answer too quickly because there's lots of them. There's lots of them. And and we're down on our knees kind of peeking through a keyhole at the workings of the mind, the mind-body connection, and I'm just scratching the barest surface. I go into other details in the book that, that are much more complex than these, but but even the the details that that boil down to a headline, so to speak, one shouldn't rush in to try to answer too quickly what's going on because sustaining the question is going to deepen the question. And we don't really know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Harvard it, researchers yeah. have not rushed to conclusions about any of these things we've been talking about. And I applaud that. Let's not rush to conclusions. Let's gather testimony. Let's see what's happening. Yeah, it seems to me the next step is performative. And in, in a funny way, it, uh, it comes back to what we were talking about earlier uh, of navigating the morality of a, of a jailbroken new thought. Because... Here, it kind of comes back to a better way of saying, oh, well, you know, um, you're poor because you're not thinking hard enough. Well, that's not actually true, but here's the thing. Right, Whatever your right. situation is, a better mental frame for approaching your same conditions will change them faster. So it's almost a, yes. it's a pragmatism to like, yeah, I, I'm not saying you're, um, the, the currents of life have put you in a situation where you have a chronic health condition or you don't have enough money or, or whatever it happens to be. That's all true. However, if you want it fixed fastest, you actually need to rather than um, fixate on that and rather than have that, which is a true thing that's happened to you, rather than yes. that be in the forefront of your mind have this instead and that yes. i think is is where the next steps have to be performative absolutely it's 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 and and what you just said is so important because the mind it's one tool among others that is extraordinarily vital and impactful on our lives and we are conditioned to neglect it or we're using it in ways that perhaps are counterproductive and if you live in a zone that attracts hurricanes, if you live in a zone that attracts drought, your mind is not going to change that. There's all kinds of reasons why that's occurring and cultural, they're environmentally based, etc., and so on. But the mind is one vital tool that we can use to fully be in possession of possibilities, options, ways, means, getting people to meet us halfway in some in some respect and we also have to go stepping in the direction of these ways and means and possibilities hopeful expectancy is participatory once you learn about your uh the nature of your job and and that it should have aerobic and anaerobic benefits well you can't stop doing your job i mean you have to take that information and continue to be operative with it and according to individual testimony both from the mystical field and studies that we're in possession of today in the 21st century it makes a difference something happens and one of the other problems with the new thought world and for some time this was a problem within serious clinical esp research as well there needs to be a theory of why there needs to be a theory of what is the delivery mechanism and in the closing moments of this show i won't i won't scale so vast a metaphysical peak, but I try to come up as best I'm capable uh, with a, a theory mm. of positive thinking in the book, because something is going on, something is happening, and we have to at least be able to debate it in terms of what is the theory, what's going on. And the theory I develop in the book, only putting it in the briefest uh, framework, is that uh, non-linearity, infinitude, observations that we're experiencing, both in quantum theory and psychical research and interdimensionality and retrocausality, tell us that what we're picking up, the information that we glean about our day-to-day -day lives through our ordinary five senses, it's accurate enough so that it gets us through life, but it's not accurate enough so that it reveals 
the infinitude of our lives and what's really going on so that it reveals that linearity, while it's a great organizing mechanism, is illusory. We're all the time selecting from ideas and possibilities. I don't use the term manifest, which is not really to my liking. Mm-hmm. I use the term select, and I think our, our, our perspective, our expectation, our emotionalized thoughts, our mental pictures, our frame of reference enlists us in an act of selectivity that's going on all the time. And selection can be hugely powerful. It creates a sense of the past, for example, that is as persuasive and as real seeming and as tactile seeming to us as the very floorboards beneath our feet. And it's meant to feel as such because we have to get through life. We have to make appointments and keep them. We have to have a sense of past, present, future. But I think that the mind is engaged in a, a, a vast and, and perhaps limitless act of selectivity all the time. And I think that's why having a thought about something or an expectation or a certain perspective or taking a measurement at a certain time makes a great difference in terms of what we're actually experiencing. Yeah. And in, in the last nine and a half minutes, uh, Mitch, <laughs> who was Neville Goddard? This was one of this. Uh, let me tell you the two things that I loved most about this book. The first was the bringing of the, the feeling along to kind of thoughts from a ritual perspective, which we've covered. And the second yes. was a, a deeper introduction to this gentleman who was called Neville Goddard. So, so who is he? He is my philosophical hero. I have him tattooed on my left forearm. And Neville was a a New Thought philosopher who was born in British Barbados, in a British family in Barbados in 1905, lived and worked in the States uh, for much of his life until his death in 1972. He was a very elegant thinker, an underground thinker, not widely heard of until recently. And he taught one basic principle, which is that your mind is God, and that the God of the Old Testament uh, and New Testament, the God of Scripture, is nothing other than a metaphor for your own creative faculties. That and floored me, that, Mitch, because yes. like anyone with any degree of competence in history is a mythicist when it comes to the stories of the Old Testament and, and yes. the New Testament and so on. And I am a mythicist. And, and Neville yes. got there almost 100 years ago. Got there almost 100 years ago. And he believes that scripture is written in a symbolic, uh, pictogrammatic language, which depicts uh, humanity's possibility and development, a story that culminates in the crucifixion of Christ, who is ultimately resurrected as God, a man in full realization of his creative powers and potential. And Neville argues with tremendous elegance and ease and simplicity in a way that always seems fresh, no matter how many times you've heard it, that everything that you experience, including the words you're hearing from me right now, is rooted in you as you are ultimately rooted in God, and that human experience is entirely self-created. And Neville would talk about things, the idea of serial universes and infinitude and multiple worlds. He would talk about things that, that, going back to the 1940s, that were going on and being talked about or not quite yet talked about in quantum theory. Uh, long before such concepts were popularized or were available to the layperson or the non-specialist. And I I write in the book that I feel Neville is the most complete uh, mystical analog to uh, quantum theory. And certain things that he says uh, and observes could come straight out of the thought experiments and theories of an Erwin Schrodinger or Richard Feynman or Hugh Everett or some of the brightest uh, figures within quantum theory. He's very much uh, in comport with those figures. Uh, probably his is the mystical voice that most closely parallels uh, quantum theory. Mm. So, uh, if he, and I, I just love this, like the idea that the God of the Old Testament in particular is identical to the human imagination, has yes. some necessary implications for what you do with your life. So, so what did Neville think was the purpose of human existence? He felt that the purpose of human existence was to become versed in one's own creativity, and over time, as one became on more and more familiar working terms with one's own creativity, you would ultimately, ultimately come to realize your Christ-like nature. And he felt this was 
uh, awaiting every human being who is 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 Christ or the Creator the, or the Creative Principle clothed in human flesh, clothed and disguised in human form, and that it was the birthright of everyone living to eventually work with, become more familiar more familiar with the creative and causative agencies of his or her own imagination, and ultimately you would be visited by experiences of awakening, real tactile experiences that would begin to unmask your true self to you, your true self being that you are God clothed in human form, and your imagination is God the creator, disclosed to you in symbol and metaphor in Old and New Testament. And the book itself uh, gets its title from a Godardian praxis that you have, uh, you know, pulled out and is now available to everyone. So, um, what is the Miracle Club and why? Uh, the Miracle Club was a group of occult experimenters that gathered together here in New York City, where I live, uh, on the west side of Manhattan in the year 1875. And they were a little occult salon that wanted to get together and probe the mysteries of the mind, of mediumship, of channeling, of table wrapping. And they, they hung together just for a short period of time, but they formed the nucleus for a much larger and deep impact. Philosophical, the Theosophical Society, uh, which I am going out to visit uh, in Chicago tomorrow. I'm visiting and uh, delivering some talks at the Theosophical Society of America. But this, of course, became an international organization that spanned the globe, reignited interest in Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, cultism, and, and caused a, a, a wave, a revolution in alternative and Eastern spirituality that the effects of which are still being felt today. Uh, I have a certain romance for the early Miracle Club, this little group that clustered together without any dog dogma, doctrine, principles, founding statements. Their aim was just to ask, uh, what is out there? And I, uh, my wish is to not only pay homage to them, but to revive that spirit of experimentation that they displayed back in 1875. Let all of us listening today ask, uh, what is out there? Let us experiment as they did. That was the original Miracle Club. And uh, and how it's constituted today is based on a sort of 3 p.m. observation um, that Neville landed on, isn't it? Yes. Interestingly enough, Neville chose the hour of 3 p.m. to go into a, a light meditative and trance state. He felt that the state of drowsiness was a state, it was sort of the prime time for using mental pictures, emotionalized thoughts to create. And it, this was also an observation that uh, the great uh, mind theorist Emil Kuey had, and today sleep researchers refer to this drowsy state. It doesn't have to be at 3 p.m. It can be at night when you're going to sleep, but they refer to this drowsy state as uh, hypnagogia, and that this hypnagogic state is one in which the mind experiences all kinds of waking dreams, hallucinations, and yet we retain control over our cognition, and it can be a time uh, in which the subconscious is impressed with new ideas. It's a time of very free-flowing thought. Psychical researchers have found that this hypnagogic state, this hovering between wakefulness and sleep, is a prime time for evidence of telepathy. Uh, so, so all of this is converging. You know, psychical research, uh, new thought, sleep research. Uh, this is one example among many of how mystical and clinical insights are converging in our generation. It's a, it's an exciting time to be a seeker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the premium members do weekly intention exercises on, on a Wednesday evening, uh, New York time, uh, based on Lynn McTaggart's work with um, Power of Eight. And so over the last year, we've seen some really, really impressive borderline miracles by, by doing so. But uh, what I like about this sort of 3pm Miracle Club idea you've got going on is the same thing. It, wherever you are sort of located in the world, just, uh, yes. just take that moment. Because uh, let me tell you, 3pm New York time is 7am here in Southern Texas. Mania, where I'm currently pretending to be a farmer, so I got up early, and it's <laughs> it's about that time that I actually do my kind of daily devotionals and and uh, oh, great. and sort of think I'm like, yeah, so I'm in, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in for the three p.m. Wonderful. New York tune-ins for sure. <laughs> Can you imagine? We'll be working together every day, you know, exactly. <laughs> different exactly. different time zones, but we'll be working together every day. That's terrific. That's wonderful. I invite everyone listening to to join in with us. I've I've keyed it to three p.m. Eastern time. Um, it doesn't have to be. You know, you can you can choose you know a different time of day but but i'm trying to find a time on the clock somewhere where all of us can get together pause for a few moments 
uh, visualize, concentrate on ethical wishes, uh, pray if one so wishes, but let's pool our energies together at that time. And see what happens. Miracle Club see rules. See what happens. Yeah. Right, exactly. Well, Mitch, fantastic talk. Obviously, the book is called The Miracle Club, but uh, where else can people find you, find out more about your other stuff, you know, you on the socials, that kind of thing. And all of this stuff right. will, of course, be in the show notes. Thank you. Uh, if you just throw my name into Google, Mitch Horowitz, it'll take you to my website. My email is there. If you want to write to me with a question or a comment, you will absolutely hear back from me. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Mitch Horowitz, Facebook at Mitch Horowitz.1. Uh, easy to find, easy to follow, and uh, you can find The Miracle Club in my books uh, through Amazon or independent booksellers or any place where they sell books. It's in uh, paperback, digital, and audio. Wonderful. Well, honestly, congratulations again. One of the best Thank books you. I've read Great this pleasure. year. Really good chat. Um, so congrats. Appreciate it so much. Thank you so much, Gordon. Be well. In addition to the intention exercises I mentioned to Mitch during the recording, one of the things the premium members have been exploring over the past year is thinking with the human imagination as being identical to the spirit world as a means of usefully comparing across cultures. Now, that's probably why I found Neville Goddard's suggestion that the God of the Old Testament is identical to the human imagination as, uh, as something that's so uh, resonant, because you can sort of stack them, right? Let's say spirit world and imagination are identical, and Yahweh being a denizen of said spirit world has sort of grown in imaginal importance, for better and for worse, over the last three or so millennia. Now, the reason we have spent so long thinking with the human imagination as identical to the spirit world is principally to enable cross-comparison with broadly described animist cultures. Now, that sort of left uh, a, a lack of interface with uh, revealed religions. And what I think is potentially useful to think with, at least for a little while, it's worth kicking the tires on anyway, is Neville Goddard's suggestion as a way of kind of interfacing, you know, revealed cosmologies with this hypothesis of spirit world and imagination being identical and, and cross-comparing that way. So at least for a little while, uh, it's, it's worth pondering. Um, so yes, The Miracle Club is one of the best books I read this year. In fact, if you are the sort of person that likes giving, you know, knowledge bomb type Christmas gifts, which is to say you're an annoying sort of person like me, then there's sort of a 2018 specific version of that that is probably Real Magic by Dr. Dean Radin, also been on the show, Lost Knowledge of the Imagination by Gary Lachman, also been on the show, and Mitch's latest. So anyway, yeah, check out the show notes for more about uh, the good Mr. Horowitz uh, and his work. Subscribe to the show wherever you damn like. Share it with your friends. Find out more at runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page. And find me on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs>